one message saying whatever. <laughs> Quantum. Just to know who you are and who are the people who are here, right? Because it's, I guess it's important to know, uh, yeah, which is the amount of people that could be interested in these kind of things. So if you don't mind. Okay, so let's continue. Where we were, okay, so we were here. So we, so we ended up the first lecture talking about this, which is a semi group of TP. TP maps, um, and um, maybe it's, so. I said that this L is called in Bladian. Okay, and somehow the reason is that Limblad, I mean, others um, found conditions that characterize. Uh, the generators for which the semi-group is really a semi-group of TPCP maps and then uh, uh, essentially uh, ELT is a semi-group what is the theorem semi-group of TPCP maps if and only if L has this particular form, okay, L in an operator acts as minus I, the commutator with A plus, and the, this, this first part is like the unitary evolution part. So if L would be exactly this, so um, commutator with an Hermitian, so H this is a self adjoint. Commutation with a Hamiltonian, then the action of the semigroup is just conjugated uh, with the exponential of IHT, which is the action of a unitary group. So it's like the unitary evolution of closed systems we saw before. And then this the, 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 the open part, so the non-closeness of the evolution is the other part. So it's summing LJ, LJ conjugate minus one half of the anti-commutator with A. So that's the product. And this is the anti-commutator. This is the anti-commutator. This is times, and this is a comma, anti-commutator. And that's it. That, that's the formula. OK, so that's, that's how it is. And this. LJs are arbitrary operators that are called jump operators. Uh, see, see, no, 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 this is the DAGA, this is the adjoint. DAGA with the rotation is a star, is the adjoint, adjoint operator. So transpose conjugate. And the same here, the same here, sorry, I put plus, this should be a DAGA. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The fact that this is TPCP it means contracting for the one norm, for the trace norm. Uh, uh, for the trace norm, it is. Every TPCP map is contracting for the trace norm. Um, yes, I probably should have said that, but that's true. So, but that's, this is true for every T because each one of those objects is TPCP. Um, okay, so that's good. Um, what else? Oh. 
Okay, yes, okay. If T is a TPCP map, uh, this acts from matrices to matrices, let's say MD to MD. Okay. And then this means that if I endow this with the trace norm, so instead of MD, let's call it S1D, no? So, so S1D is MD with the trace norm. And the trace norm is just the trace of the absolute value of x. Uh, an absolute value is the square root of that. Um, and that, that, that's a Banach space. Okay. Normal space is Banach because it's finite dimensional, but one can define also in infinite dimensions, and now it will be a set of compact operators with this norm. And then T is contractive here, so meaning that uh, the norm of T is less than 1. As a, as a linear map from here to here. Uh, it is, let's say, must be commutated with a plus instead of with a minus. Any other question? No, 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 no. This is one of the, one of the things I'm not going to prove. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, to show that if L is of this form, it is TPCP, I think this not. This is not hard. To show that this is the only possibility, yeah, probably it's not trivial. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Uh, I can try to go back to these old papers and, and tell tomorrow, but I was not. I'm not using this in any part of the of the lecture, in any case. So. I'm using, all I'm using is that it's TPCP, so this particular structure. But it's not this particular st structure used if you go to, con to concrete examples. Uh, uh, but that's. No, no, it's very useful. <laughs> it's, it's useless for the purpose of this talk. It's very useful because these L LJs have <laughs> particular meaning. So it's, uh, it's simply that I'm not going to use here. <laughs> that's an implied. I have used it. I have used it in my, some of my papers, but, but not, not in this. In this lecture so um okay so, so it's just to say that while in bladian is because of this theorem uh, good okay why uh, these semi-groups are interesting in quantum computing why uh, these why are these semi-groups Interesting. In quantum computing. Okay. There are several reasons, but two main ones are uh, first of all, these are uh, uh, noise models, so standard noise model, standard noise models. Uh, for quantum systems, for and in particular to study how noise affects quantum computation or quantum memories, essentially uh, these objects model the noise. So, for instance, the most um, common way to model thermal noise. So, if you put your system in contact with a thermal bath, uh, in such a way that the coupling between system in the bath is weak. Uh, it's called the, I mean the Davis semigroup here, and and then then this is kind of mathematical physics. You say the standard model to model uh, evolution under the thermal noise, um, and then in the last lecture we will show how uh, this noise affects quantum memories, in particular for this thermal noise. Okay, so that's one. Um, also, the most standard way. Uh, or the most one of the most uh, important sources of noise in experiments is the, the polarizing noise, which is also something of this form. Uh, so, okay, things like that. So, as a noise, and there is, a, but uh, this is kind of the negative way of looking at that. Okay, in the sense that this is a bad guy, but also there is a, a model of computation I will com I will comment in some of the sections, uh, which is that one can, which is dissipative. Quantum computation, 
and in particular dissipative state engineering, quantum state. Quantum state engineering. As we will show also in the models of computation, important part of quantum computing is sometimes to generate a particular nice state. It could be a thermal state of some model of interest, the ground state of some Hamiltonian of interest that will solve our problems or some problems in chemistry, etc. Uh, or just to solve a computation. And then in 2009, I think, uh, Ignacio Zirac, Frank Verstrete, and Mich Michael Wolf, I think it was 2009, show that in principle one can do universal quantum computation by engineering a particular type of noise and let the system evolve. And the solution of the computation is the fixed point of the evolution. Okay, so essentially, uh, in a sense, it's a time independent computation. So just prepare the system, some interactions in the system with some bath and let the system evolve. And at the end of the evolution, uh, you have your solution. So in both problems, the relevant relevant question is the convergence time. So is to bound the, let's put, is to bound the distance. Let's put first like that the distance between Let's call it the state at time t when we initialize at time some initial state rho, rho naught to rho infinity, which by definition rho infinity is equal to the limit when t goes to infinity of uh, t t del of e l t of rho naught. Uh, we will make several assumptions. In particular, we will show that the fixed point of the evolution because this is clearly a fixed point of evolution, is unique. Okay, so one can deal with more general cases, but in these lectures we will not do that. So we assume, so this row infinity is the fixed point of the evolution. So this is the fixed point of the evolution. We assume unique. So, exactly, I'll go to that in a second. That, that, that's, a, that's an important point. This is why I so far avoid it. <laughs> that, I'll go to that. So, uh, so just before going exactly into that, let, let me just go back to why this is the relevant thing. For, so if for noise models, usually rho infinity is a point in which all the information is lost. For instance, for thermal noise, there will be a thermal state. In the thermal state, all the information encoded in the memory is gone. So essentially, this will tell me uh, if this is sufficiently close to rho infinity, so if this distance is small, this tells me that all my quantum information is lost. And in particular, this will measure the lifetime of my quantum memory, or the time I have to uh, my decoherence time. No? So, and that's the relevant thing. So how long can I use my memory? Uh, or, in this, this tells me the efficiency of the algorithm. So, which is the time it takes the algorithm to solve my problem. Because rho infinity now is the solution of my problem in, in dissipative quantum computation. So this distance, so the time it takes that for this distance to be small tells me the, uh, the time I have to wait for my solution and therefore is the complexity of my algorithm, no? the, the, the time um, it takes to solve the problem. So, so essentially, we would like to, to show, just to bound this in particular, uh, obtain bounds for the obtain bounds for the mixing time. It's called the mixing time, which is now epsilon, which is the infimum. Uh, 
of all the t's, uh, sorry, the infimum of the t's, so that uh, t t of rho naught, uh, okay, the distance, is good. and now we write the distance, the distance of t t of rho naught to rho infinity is less than epsilon for all rho naught. Okay, so independently of the initial state, so I don't have to care about initialization, um, which is the time in which I can guarantee that the distance to a fixed point is n um, Okay, so now what about the distance? So any question about the motivation? So again, uh, okay, so that's, that's the... Uh, okay, no, no, the, 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 this noise model for quantum systems this is very old. I mean, these this, this papers from Davy, of Davies, just for the uh, for the case of of, of thermal bath, these are from the early 70s, so I guess late 60s, all these things. Application to quantum computing, this is 2009. So this this, this second part is 2009, and and then bounds bounds for yeah. Okay, so that's that's. Because in, in, usually, in all these old papers from the um, yeah okay, as I say bounds in the many body regime uh, in which one can give good estimates for these things. These are very recent, so these are the last thirty years. Many of these definitions are independent uh, of having many particles or not. So essentially, the understanding the many body regime was very much motivated, I think, by quantum computation, and, and this is more recent. Uh, but I mean, the general background is very old, yes. yes, yes. Um, okay. Good. Uh, what, uh, sorry, distance. I was saying distance. Okay, so distance is this distance, okay? So the one we care. But this is not the one we use. <laughs> so, because it's very difficult to deal with that. So, essentially, the distance we will take as the norm band. So, sigma we will consider. So, we, uh, this, is, this is the distance we like. And the reason is that precisely because of the postulates of quantum mechanics is the distance that tell me that for any measure I do, any observable I measure here and here, uh, the uh, results I get differ at most this distance. Essentially, I mean, this is the distance that is physically relevant in the sense, and the reason is that if reason if rho minus sigma norm one is less than epsilon, what happens, and A is an observable, remember that this is type of the physical quantities I can obtain from rho by measuring the observable. So the difference of these two quantities, if I do this in rho or in sigma, these are numbers now. So it's less or equal than, of course, linearity of the trace. This is trace of A times rho minus sigma. And then it's not difficult to show that, as I say, the trace norm and the operator norm are dual, are dual via the trace. So this is the operator norm of A, so op or infinity, and the trace norm of rho minus sigma. So this is less or equal than the operator norm of A times epsilon. Okay. Okay, the operator norm of A is just the natural uh, measurement, uh, natural norm for an observable. Usually, is kind of the energy scale in which we live. Maximum energy. So if A is a Hamiltonian, that's the maximum energy. So it's that kind of the boundary energy we have in the system. So essentially, this tells me that. If this is a small, for any observable I have, this is going to be a small. And these are the things I can obtain by measuring. So essentially, rho and sigma are indistinguishable up to epsilon. 
Good. Problem is that uh, dealing with this norm is a mess. It's very difficult, even if it looks easy, but this absolute value uh, kills you. Uh, so then the goal, so the idea is to go to a stronger notion uh, of distance. Now it's not a distance, but it's a, uh, which has much nicer properties. And that is an upper bound to this one and work with that. And that's the quantum relative entropy. So the, so now uh, we will look for a stronger bounds. Okay. So that if we are able to bound uh, this stronger uh, quantities, then in particular, we'll make a bound on that. But this one has nice, nicer properties, and then we can play with that. That's the idea. Okay, so, um, so in particular, we'll talk about the quantum relative entropy. Which is kind of the quantum analog to the KL divergence in classical systems. Okay, so definition. Okay, so this is the, um, okay, the new measure of distance between two states rho and sigma. Again, it's not a distance, doesn't have any triangular inequality or things like that, but somehow has nice, as we will see, has nice properties that this is zero if and only if rho is equal to sigma and these things. So uh, it's equal to, uh, let me push. Okay, let me put the signs right, just to avoid plus and the minus. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, exactly, trace of rho log rho minus trace of rho log sigma. Um, okay, <laughs> why that? Okay, probably you should have defined before uh, for Neumann entropy. Yeah, so that this has some meaning. Is roll no roll of sigma? It's crucial. Roll of sigma. Okay. Otherwise, it would be the difference of the entropy of this with the entropy of that, and that has this. There's nothing that mixes the two things. Uh, so, you know, it's roll of sigma. So, this is not symmetric. Okay, so this is another difference with the usual distances. Okay, so that's not. Um, okay, so. Okay, so I forgot to say that the uh, entropy of rho is minus trace rho log rho. And this is, of course, an entropy because, I mean, if, if rho, again, rho is a state, so it's semi definite positive, in particular, it's normal, can be diagonalized in some basis. Now we know that rho log rho is, so rho is rho, and the logarithm acts on the eigenvalues. Of course, the two things commute, and therefore rho log rho is that the sum in I of lambda I log lambda i vi vi and now uh, if i take the trace of course uh, it's just the sum of these objects so minus uh, so the entropy of rho is just minus the sum in i of lambda i log lambda i and that, that's the usual shannon entropy of the eigenvalues okay so essentially it's simple in the Shannon entropy of the eigenvalues. That's why it's an entropy. Uh, so this is called the von Neumann entropy. Entropy. And this is the relative entropy, which is kind of the analog of what is called the KL divergence in the, in the classical setup. Um, okay, so again, we are using 
information theory quantities, so entropic quantities, and the reason is that they behave very well. Okay, so that's, that's why we go to entropic quantities. And that's why this has to do, this is quantum information theories because it uses information theory concepts like these ones to deal with the objects. No? So that's, okay, so that's the quantum relativity entropy has very nice properties. The first one, okay, it's usually not the first one stated, but it's the one that will relate the quantum relative entropy with the trace norm is spin scale inequality. By the way, again, by uh, connect, I mean, just going, understanding how all these things are uh, the classical analogs. So if we work with diagonal objects, so essentially rho and sigma commute. So the trace norm is the usual variational distance between probability distributions, okay, which is, again, the standard way to define distance between probability distributions. Okay, p scale inequality tells us that uh, rho minus sigma one square one half is bounded by the relative entropy. So, if we are able to, to obtain uh, times, oh, I erase it, okay, times, convergence times in which the relative entropy is smaller than epsilon, then the trace norm would be also small, okay, square root of epsilon, but okay, crazy, okay, so, so that's, that's why these bounds that we are looking for, now they are bounds in the relative entropy, are stronger. At least in some sense. Okay, and which are the other nice properties we have? That are the ones that allow to. Ah, it's kind of weird, right? Because the left hand side is symmetric, but the right yes. Yes, 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 yes. The same is true for the other, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I agree. Yes, yes, yes. It's a weird quantity. Um, okay, so. Which are the properties? So the, this is one, okay, and then the more standard properties. So is continuous. Okay, let me. Uh, okay, let, let's let's write that, and now we write properties here, and the reason is that the properties I'm going to define here from one to six or seven characterize that formula. So essentially, if I have any functional that fulfills one to six, it, it is exactly this, up to a constant. Okay, so since these properties characterize that. So continuity in the first variable. Now, by the way, to avoid problems, uh, we will always assume that sigma is full rank uh, because otherwise this lock, the, the lock of zero or something, no? I, I forgot to say. I mean, sigma will be always full rank. We assume this always to be full rank. Rho doesn't need to, but sigma. Uh, continuity in phase variable. Second, uh, non negativity. I mean, look that. Uh, if there is a plus and a minus, I mean, it could be, no, but no, it's not negative. In particular, because we can write we will later the mutual information, which is another information theoretic quantity, would be relevant in the many body regime. As a, as a particular relative entropy, this will show that the mutual information is also <laughs> non negative, non negativity. In particular, meaning that. This is always positive, and is zero if and only if rho is equal to sigma. Okay, so both things. Uh, three uh, is finite finiteness, meaning that rho sigma is finite if, of course. The support of sigma contains the support of rho. In our case, 
Okay, ready like that in order to claim that these properties characterize that. In our case, because I'm assuming that this is full rank, uh, and this is always true. For data processing inequality, this is very useful. Inequality. This means that uh, you know, be very equal. Uh, for all t tpcp. So if I apply a tpcp map, all I can do is to reduce them. I have to apply the same to both sides, of course. Otherwise, I can't do anything. Okay. You see, if I process the information, uh, the most I can, in the same way, in both states, all I can do is to reduce the entropy. Five, additivity. Additivity, which means that if I have tensor products, some of these properties are trivial, some are not at all. Some are, oh, okay. Not at all means that they, they are reduced from the strong subadditivity uh, of, uh, of the entropy, conditional entropy. Um, but uh, but okay, that's that's. I will take all these for granted. So this is equal to the d rho a sigma a plus d rho b sigma b, and super additivity. which is that if the second is a tensor pool but the first is not, this is bigger or equal than the other two. Sigma A plus D rho B sigma D. Okay. Okay, so these are the properties and theorem these properties characterize this formula. Theorem, and this theorem is from, it's not that old, but it uses Diego, Isert, Wilhelm, Wilming, sorry. And, but they uh, relying on, uh, used a previous characterization of this by Matsumoto, which is actually based on pa previous paper by Matsumoto. Uh, Prove that uh, if we have a, a essentially this one to one to six characterize. Uh, the uh, the relative entropy. Sorry, five. this is an equality. Is equality? Yes, equal. exactly. Yes, yes. So if both are tensor products, uh, this is a sum. If the second is a tensor product and the first is not, this is a, a, a inequality. And now. Uh, very relevant for the bounds that at some points will appear is make, making a, a stronger version of six when this is not a tensor product, it's an arbitrary state, and we still give the same, but we pay a multiplicative price, uh, which is a function of the distance between the state I put here and, and the analog state with a tensor product, essentially. So, so I mean, we need to make a, a stronger version of six. Yes. So, I'm just trying to add it to the bounds. Can you reverse the argument? Uh, no, as far as I know. It must be like that.
yeah, I, I can think of that. I don't know how many time. I don't think so. Uh, uh, I don't know. Mm, I would guess no, but that. Okay. For a moment, no, exactly, exactly. So the yeah, so the reason that we really somehow care about uh, the in any case, I mean, this is just the properties that characterize the entropy. But uh, uh, still, in our case, the reason we care about the second argument being tensor or indeed close to a tensor product is because in general, uh, the fixed points of the evolutions uh, that we care that the, at least so far we have been able to bound are thermal states. And essentially, uh, if the regions are sufficiently par far apart, um, the, uh, because of the, some exponential clustering property, uh, the state is not a tensor product, but is not far from being a tensor product. So that's why we need a continuity version of this in which we relax this condition and we get approximate bounds. Okay, that's how they. So why this is very relevant for us or versions of that. Good. Okay, so. So far, these are just pro properties and a nice quantity. Um, and now, okay, so now goal, so which is the idea. Yeah. If we could say that we could bound this by this. Um, no? Then, by Gromwell's inequality, then we would have that d of dt or not or infinity would be less or equal than e to the minus alpha key of the distance. Okay, and in particular, uh, this will converge to zero with t exponentially fast. OK? If, of course, if. So in particular, uh, the mixing time, so the time it takes for this object to be smaller than epsilon, and in particular, the trace known to be smaller than epsilon or the square root of epsilon will be essentially logarithmic um, uh, in one over epsilon. Okay, well, alpha also plays a role. This assuming alpha is constant. Although it's, it's okay, so so for instance, so we would like to to have bounds on this alpha here. Good. So that's that's the goal. So now that we would like to know is how this thing. This, uh, this inequality looks like in the infinitesimal generator. And this will define the first function of inequality, which is the modified log of of inequality. Any questions so far, by the way? For example, you have this uh, row ID, and then let's use uh, this row ID uh, row B to see after the measurement what changed uh, with respect to the full system. Again, can, can you like, like if the state is entangled? Yes. And then this is, we always do when we measure we disentangle it, so we we end up with the for example row A and tensor product row B. And then we take the measure of uh, rho a b, uh, rho a tensor product. Okay, so you so you say whether one could look at this, mm. but for the same uh, for the same system that of course after the measure is is different because you lost the entanglement. Uh, uh, but maybe a. like the the goal for that is like uh, like to see 
the the difference between the state before the measurement and after. No. I don't know if it makes sense. Know. Maybe you can talk later about okay. this. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, indeed, let me just. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. So I can say, yeah, I don't know. Because I was saying, though, maybe you would like to use this as a way to define somehow the entanglement present in the system or something, but that's, that's true. So if, yeah, so this could be so in the same. So if instead of sigma, you put rho here, so you compare with this distance, yeah. rho AB with respect to rho A tensor rho B. So you take the marginal of rho in A, tensor the marginal rho in B, and you compare this to rho AB. So this is by definition the mutual information. And the mutual information is, of course, uh, the, the, one of the most important notions of, of correlations between A and B. It measures both quantum and classical, but that's the, so in the sense, yes, this is exactly one of the most used ways of measure the, the B, <laughs> not being a product, if you want. Uh, but I love this, this was what, what you were saying. It's exactly the mutual information. This is exactly the mutual information. Yes, uh, yes so, uh, so it's only a question. So what? The mutual information between systems A and B is just you can define so it's just you can define as the entropy of A plus the entropy of B. Sorry, in rho is just the entropy of rho A, A rho A B plus the entropy of rho B minus the entropy of rho A B. But it's not difficult to see that this is the same as rho a b rho a tensor rho b so it's just yeah. okay so good any other question good uh, and that's by the way this is the mutual information Good. Um, okay. 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 Exactly. Okay. So we are we are there, and then we'd like to understand how this this inequality uh, implies. Uh, sorry, is it can be seen at the level of the infinitesimal generator. So how. To see this at the level of the Limbladian. Good. Uh, okay, so for that we we'll need to make an assumption, which is the what is called the quantum detail balance. So it's the analog of the standard detail balance assumption in Markov processes or in stochastic matrices, or that is called some, sometimes also reversibility. And in a sense, it's to recover self-adjointness. So L, the Limbladian, is not self-adjoint at all. That's an even have to, uh, have to have the real spectrum. Um, and the, the idea is that uh, same happens for classical processes, but then sometimes, or in many cases indeed, one has some uh, reversibility, and this means that one recovers self-adjoint in a different Hilbert space, when you twist the Hilbert space. And the way to twist it is with respect to the fixed point of the evolution. And we'll, and we'll do simply the quantum, uh, so the non-commutative analog of that. Okay, so now the, essentially we define some um, escalar product with some weights, which are defined by the, which is a, a weighted version of the standard Hilbert Smith scalar product for matrices. Uh, and the weight will be given by the fixed point of the evolution. And we'll assume that the um, Elimblad is self adjoint in that object. And okay, the nice thing is that many of these examples of noise models that we care about are fulfill that condition. Okay, so it's not really a too strong condition, but we need that. Okay, so we assume. Is called the quantum detailed 
detailed balance condition, which is the following. Uh, L is self-adjoint. Um, with respect to the following scalar product. XY rho infinity equal to the trace of rho infinity oh, sorry, rho infinity x standard y. Okay. So if we remove the rho infinity, this is the standard Hilbert Smith scalar product for matrices. Um, and now we put a weight, which is a state. Um, and of course, for this to be a scalar product, we need rho infinity to be full rank. So we also assume that. We assume rho infinity is full rank. In any case, we need that because we, we want to compute the relative entropy. And in the second argument is rho infinity, and we were saying that we will consider always rho infinity to be full rank. So it's part of our hypothesis. Again, for the models of thermal noise, these are thermal state, and thermal states are always full rank. Okay, so in this case, this is not a problem. Yes. Yes. So is this case a very big problem for this method? So I mean, can you solve it by approximating it is, it is or a big problem. it breaks everything, right? No, 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 no. It, does, uh, it breaks this first part. Okay. So as we will tell later, so in order to understand this type of bounds and the kind of the infinitesimal version, which is what I'm going to tell here, these are called these MLSI bounds. Um, Essentially, one first usually proves a bound on the spectral gap, which is weaker, and then try to upgrade this, upgrade that to an MLSA bound. I mean, same, same as is done also in many cases in the classical case. Um, so the spectral gap part does not break. Uh, uh, but this, uh, and then from there, there are other ways in which one can get bounds on the mixing time. Uh, but but it's true. It's true that yeah, that essentially many of these first part, uh, yeah, breaks down at least in principle. Yes. Okay. Yes, indeed. Okay. This is a very good question. If one can get, uh, because of course from a spectral gap bounds you get bounds on alpha, but the bounds are not that good, and in particular. Yeah, it's not clear. It's not clear to me. In principle, uh, yeah, this is a. We need this hypothesis. Yes, yes. I'm thinking whether. Uh, so far, I think I don't know any technique. To deal with that, in the for convergence in the one norm. Yeah. Yes. It's another question, if I may. I find it conceptually a bit difficult because the uh, the Lindbladian is acting on uh, a space which is essentially the space of states, and it's that joint is acting on the operate on the observables yes, yes, essentially. Yes, yes, yes. So talking about self jointness is because you are including, you are making this inclusion, or you are extending the operation also to the to the. Uh, so that's easy to do in matrices. Yes, it's definitely yes, yes, yes. But, uh, no, no, of course, conceptually, everything I, is finite dimensional. Again, everything is finite dimensional. I agree. I agree some of these things are maybe not obvious how to do in the infinite dimensional case, but this is finite dimensional all the time. Yes, yes, I agree. Yes. In, in, uh, and that's, yeah, yes, that's, that's definitely crucial, yes. Okay, so any any other question? So, yeah. So for instance, so it is, no, your question is, is very nice because it's a question that we have been trying to analyze for, for ages. Uh, so one possibility one, one can do, and that's somehow something one can try, is imagine that you want to construct, use a Limbradian to construct a particular quantum state which is pure, no, quantum state engineering. Then what you can do is imagine you want to construct the toric code. 
okay, what you can do, and indeed, uh, is okay, take a temperature which is small enough and construct the thermal state of the torque at that temperature. Nothing breaks here. If the temperature is small enough, the error in, in, in trace norm between your thermal state and the ground state is very small. And indeed, in this way, you can find, you can match the optimal convergence bounds to construct the toric code. So, so this is something you can do always. But if you insist, no, 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 I want something which is really pure, uh, so not full rank, yeah, th this I, I don't know. Yes, yes. This, this, this for instance, this, this is something we, we, we do. We do. We do. So, in order to understand how this with my last lecture, but I mean, anticipate essentially we show that with the Davis generator, we can estimate. Okay, again, let's put this way. No, we it's a work in progress because because <laughs> if we far so far is not is that. But imagine we can prove uh, that at any temperature, we can. We, we know how to prove that at any temperature, the Limbladian has a nice gap. And okay, now we're working on whether we can have a nice alpha here. But imagine we do. We, uh, we know how this alpha scales with, scale with the temperature. And it, imagine it scales similarly as how the gap scales with the temperature. That is what we expect. Then we, we will have exponential fast convergence to the thermal state. Even, of course, if the time also scales badly with the temperature, things match, and you will get a linear time convergence, which is what you, the best you can hope for a toric code. So essentially, essentially, you will match the convergence. So this is something, yeah. But but somehow the the, the, the same. Uh, so it's, yeah. So in a sense, the same is true, for instance, for many of these sort of. Um, uh, uh, algorithms to minimize functions by uh, simulated annealing. No, so essentially you you want to find the minimum of a function, but the, in the classical world, and then you you fix a temperature, and you try to convert to sampling from the thermal distribution, or the given distribution, a sufficient enough temperature, and then one can prove that with enough probability, if you sample from the distribution, you get something which is sufficiently close to the minimum of the function. So this is kind of the analog. So you would like to obtain a pure state, which is the ground state of, of some Hamiltonian, and then try to construct the thermal state at sufficiently low temperature. And in principle, this gives you ways to bound rigorously the time you need for that. Whether this is optimal or not, that's a different question. But so, the, so these techniques allow you to do that. Let's see if I got it right, but that would apply if you have uh, um, if you have a channel that if you have a continuous that's simply uh, energy de energy, energy de de depletion, and you have essentially and it is gapped. You are talking about the gapped system. No, 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 no sorry. I, now I was talking about the gap of the Limbladian. That in principle has nothing to do with the gap of the system of the Hamiltonian. Okay. That's a different story. Yeah, because you. That's a different story. Yeah, no, that's a different story because you always can have. Okay, because otherwise, if you have the cap Hamiltonian, then necessarily you would have that whenever the, the temperature, the temperature fluctuations is. I don't know. Sorry, sorry. No, no. Yeah, yeah. I understand. No, no. Of course, the the fact that the thermal state, a sufficiently low temperature, is close to the ground state requires some properties on the energy distribution of the Hamiltonian. Of course, of course, of course. Yes. But as long as the Hamiltonian is decent, meaning that not the eigenstate eigenvalues are concentrated very close to the ground state, so essentially it has some sort of a Gaussian like distribution, then this is true. Yes, yes, yes. But, I'm sorry, do I have to think this alpha is a constant? That's the way you are No, 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 it can scale with, uh, yeah, again. It can be a, No, 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 it, it, yeah, yes, it's a very good question. So far I'm in the single particle case. Of course, I would like to do that. I'm talking about, about the future, but in the, for the many body regime. And all I care is how the time scales with the, system size with the number of particles in the system. This is what I care about. And then we like how alpha scales with the number of particles. If this is independent of the number of particles, I'm super happy. But but 
even if, 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 if this is kind of one over log or something, it's totally okay. Even if it's one over poly, it's totally okay. The poly mini polynomial with the log system. But uh, so that that's but of course constant gives exponential time convergence. Uh, but sometimes this is too good to be true. Uh, but if this is one over polynomial on the system size, again, if this is one over n, essentially n the system size with t equal n plus something, this already converges. So it converges of linear time. So yeah, doesn't need to be constant, but it, it, it must scale reasonably well with the system size. Um, more questions? Okay, good. So, okay, so, uh, yeah, okay, good. Uh, so, okay, so this is not the only escalar product. Uh, so, by the way, yeah, if this is not full rank, the, okay, no, well, let's forget about it. Let's not, let's, yeah, I already talked too much about it. So, so, so this is not the only escalar product one can use or one can take. There are several, and in particular, there is another one that will appear. But the thing is that if the L is self adjunct with respect to this one, it's also self adjunct with respect to the other one. So we'll assume the stronger condition, which is this one. But there is also another scalar product, which we call. That's about the bad thing with quantum mechanics, because things do not commute. There are several options always. Another scalar product. Indeed, there are several, but OK, I will take only this one which is called x, y, rho infinity, comma, one half, which is the trace of rho infinity, one half, x dagger, rho infinity, one half, y. OK, so, OK. And of course, one could put s, one minus s, and put an s here. But OK, we'll only use the one half, so. Um, so if L is self-adjoint with respect to that, it's also self-adjoint with respect to this one. So that's OK. Uh, and we will define, uh, OK, when, when, when we define LP or L2 of rho infinity is the Hilbert space associated to this one. And LP of rho infinity, uh, okay, is kind of the analog. So let me write it properly. LP of an infinity is exactly uh, sorry, definition exactly is defined by X P is the trace of rho infinity um, one over two P x rho infinity 1 over 2p absolute value p 1 over p p no no that's p that's p that's p That's, that's, that's how it is, yes. Uh, okay. Okay, see that these are kind of non-commutative LP spaces. Uh, and okay, they appear in non-commutative harmonic analysis and these things. Uh, in particular, Javier Parcet and Marius Junger have done a lot of work with these things. Um, okay, so uh, what else? Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. I was assuming it was just a, a small thing, but we I'm, I'm in the uh, still trying to get the analog of that at the infinitesimal level. And then for that, uh, we have the following lemma. I think this is originally due to Herbert Spawn in the 70s. Uh, and is which is not difficult to show, by the way, but is very interesting, which tell me that if I do, okay, LP, so this is 
rho zero, rho infinity, at t equals zero. Sorry, this is rho. Um, at t equals zero. This is equal to minus the trace of L of rho times log rho minus log rho infinity. This is exactly it. And this here is called the ent entropy production. Okay, this or that, which is called, is called, this quantity is called the entropy production by obvious reasons, because it's the derivative of how the entropy behaves. And we will then I will denote it by entropy production of rho on sub L if L is not obvious from the context. Okay, so so yes. Okay, this is an infinity here, by the way. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Probably this solves the confusion, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> No, 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 this is row infinity. So essentially how, exactly, this, this is how, the, yeah, yeah, okay, how the distance go, grows. So essentially this is this part here, okay, with a negative sign, but that's this part. And it simply tells me that this, this simple quantity, which is linear in L, I mean, it's not surprising if you think about it, but this is how it is, okay? So now, this now allows me to write the first function inequality, finally, which is the modified log of inequality. So, uh, okay, definition, if alpha times the distance rho, rho infinity is less or equal than the entropy production of L, um, a rho for all rho, okay, with the entropy production is that, so essentially this is equal to the minus the trace L rho log rho minus log rho infinity, okay? So if this is true, so look that this part does not depend on L. This is the only part of personnel and it's linear on it. Okay, so that's, we say that uh, the system fulfills a. We say that the semigroup or whatever satisfies, fulfills, fulfills a modified. log Sobolev inequality with constant alpha. And okay, we write MLSI because modify log Sobolev inequality is too long, okay? Good? And now, since this happens for all rho, if we apply to rho equal rho sub t or sub s, uh, this implies this. And, and we are happy like that. So now this, okay, of course if you put the minus everywhere and apply this to rows, which are rho sub t's, this implies this, okay? So essentially this inequality guarantees exponentially fast convergence with the, exp I mean with the coefficient in the exponent being equal to alpha and alpha is this constant of the MSI. Okay, so that's our first character. Any question? Good. 
leave it there so that you get familiar with that. And then, okay, for me it's sometimes strange that the first inequality I introduced is already called modified. Since I didn't modify anything yet. Uh, but that, okay, that's of course for historical reasons. Uh, so let me now define the, define the non-modified, even though I will not use it because it's too strong. So, uh, uh, sorry, what, what? D, 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 of course, this must happen for all rho. This is just rho and rho infinity, yes. Oh, what do you mean? But of course, look at the in the entropy uh, in the in the entropy production, you have also rho and rho infinity here. Uh, so. If the alpha exists, that goes to Ah, so, so, so sorry. Yeah, that, that's the question, of course. If, exactly. If there exists an alpha, thanks, uh, probably it would be the right way to write it. If there exists an alpha, uh, positive, of course. So that this happens, then we say. But the, the, the alpha must be the same for all rho. That's it. Maybe the question you are going to. Yes, it's the infinitesimal generator. No, but wait, 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 wait. This, yeah, exactly. If you want, because you're going to start in any place. So, because, yeah, 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 yeah. So, Roy is any state. Can be where you start, the middle of the process, anything. It must happen for all row. And that's a difficult thing to check that this happened for all row. That's the hard thing. Uh, say in the medieval regime, because row can be really anything. A volume low, entangled state, anything. And still, you must prove that for the very same alpha for all of them. That's the hard part. There is nothing related to a spectral quantities of imagine that rho infinity is some Hamiltonian thermal state or something. There is nothing ready to, in principle, to the spectra that helps. That's the difficult thing. Okay, yes. Some other questions? Okay, so okay, so why modified? Uh, so okay, so let's. So one can also use uh, define uh, non-modified, so essentially a standard log sobole inequalities uh, but the problem is that they are Uh, too strong. Uh, can I put it like that? Okay. In the following sense, that it's proven that the inequalities I will write here are stronger than this one. So you have this, in particular, you have that. Uh, and there are examples in which uh, uh, one can prove that there is a finite alpha here and there is no finite alpha here. In some cases, they are worse. And also, the, there are no known techniques to prove those things also, whether, 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 whereas we have some techniques to prove this. So that's, but this doesn't imply that suddenly someone finds, that for some particular interesting cases, uh, there are techniques that work for this particular family and not for the others. So that's why I will write them, but I will not use them for anything at all. Okay? But the nice thing is that these are the quantum analog to the most standard classical log sobole inequalities that probably are familiar to some of you. That's why I also write them. But they are stronger than this one. So, okay, good. Uh, okay, so uh, LSI, log sobole inequality, is the following. is now alpha entropy to x less or equal than minus x L of x, uh, sorry, yes, F, L of x, rho infinity one half. This is called the Dirichlet functional, uh, the Dirichlet form, sorry, which is the energy Dirichlet form. So this is just simply the, yeah, 
So the d form associated to L is like the energy of L, if you want, since L is self-adjoint in this Hilbert space, this is just the energy. This is the energy. Energy. Uh, and this is the entropy of X, but of course, now, how do you define the entropy? The entropy is the relative entropy of, that's why now it's getting a bit strange, but again, this is just, maybe, I will explain why, in a second, why all these things appear, rho infinity, and now, <laughs> Gamma sigma is the operator on x is sigma one half x sigma one half. Okay, and I apply it to rho, uh, rho, this is rho infinity. Okay, so I take x. So I take the square root of this operator and I square it. Um, so the square root of this operator acting on x, square that matrix, and compute the relative entropy with respect to rho infinity. So this is called what is called entropy two. One can define entropy one, entropy p, by changing the parameters that appear there. But that's entropy two. And LSI is that this happens so there exists an alpha, so that this is true for all x. Now x semi-definite positive, I mean, so that this entropy is well defined. Uh, so this is much more uh, is close to the standard log of f inequalities in which one bounds some entropy of some function now by somehow the energy. Okay, so that's that's, that's the this is the the log of f inequality. If there is an alpha that makes this true, same alpha or maybe. Constant times this alpha makes that true. Uh, this uh, was defined by Teme and Castoriano. In 2012. Looking for quantum generalizations of the usual logs of inequalities. Uh, and the reason why this is particularly nice is that they could prove, okay, up to some details that were proven later, that this is equivalent to having hypercontractivity for uh, these non-commutative Fermi spaces. So this is equivalent to hypercontractivity. Meaning that um, the operator E, okay, L star T, and now sorry that I take the adjoint operator L star, um, uh, and that's because I, I took this from, from the paper and I was too lazy to do the computation for the non star, okay, so this is the adjoint. Uh, so I, I, um, uh, it's contractive, meaning that the norm is less or equal than one from L to rho infinity. I just define it here to L P T rho infinity, and now this P depends where P T is equal to one plus E to the two alpha T. Okay, which is the standard hypercontractivity result. Uh, um, okay, it's, it's probably familiar to, to some of you. So essentially, um, this inequality captures the hypercontractivity the same way that it does for classical systems. And now the LP spaces that one needs here are these non-commutative LP spaces defined uh, like that. So this says that as long as time goes, you improve the P in which you are. 
in a way which is exponential in time. And this is an if and only if. So in a sense, this okay, this is why this is a nice inequality. As I say, these two are extremely stronger than this MLSA. It's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how as you know for sure hyperconductivity in the strongest possible form can be very useful in some contexts, but but in this particular context, I don't know whether it has been used at all. Particularly because it's very difficult to prove that you have it. Uh, it's not like the standard the contractivity for it's known in, for, for without hypothesis. Not here you have to prove that you have hypercontractivity uh, for the L you are interested in essentially. But yeah, I, I cannot answer. I mean, as far as I know, it has not been used in any place that comes to my mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 no it's, it was very interesting. No, 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 yeah, no, it was very interesting to see that these two things, and it was the very beginning, so since it was not clear yet who was the right quantity. So this MLSI approach came after that. So they could prove directly that with this, you also had, a, I mean, exponential fast convergence in the one norm. So they could prove directly from that. Uh, and so, so simply they, it turned out later that this was maybe too strong for the systems we are interested in. Uh, and then yeah. one, one needs to relax to that. But I don't know, it was a very, very influential paper, this one. So they put this into the, into the, of course, usually in the first paper, you, you never go to the exact point. No? You just <laughs> you navigate a bit. And, uh, okay, and they could prove I'm a bit. So they really could prove using the techniques convergence of some cases, but they were not really the many body regime we were interested in. See. So exactly. So it's, well, I think yeah, it's a very interesting paper, but uh, I think they, they apply to particular cases, but they are not really the hard cases that one cares about. So they illustrate this with, with examples, which are interesting, but maybe they were just first steps. Okay, so so this is going into the stronger. One can also go, this is going into the stronger. One can also go into the weaker. Uh, by keeping something very similar, is, instead of doing entropy, one does variance. So now, uh, So now we define Poincaré inequality. Which is exactly this, but here we have the variance of x. And the variance is as it should be, but with this L2 thing there. So it's equal to the norm of x in L2 rho infinity minus the trace to infinity x squared. Okay, so again, it's just bounding the variance by the energy, so that's the standard Poincaré inequality, and this is known to be equivalent uh, to the gap of L. So essentially, um, uh, the spectral gap. No, so this this is true if and only if L has spectral gap um, since the, 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 the uh, eigenvalues of L are or negative and it has an eigenvalue zero which is of course associated to the fixed point so the spectral gap is uh, the difference between zero and the first negative eigenvalue okay. and this sorry yeah, 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 yes, of course. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, and the spectral gap is alpha. Okay, maybe alpha up to a constant two or something like that. Okay, essentially alpha. So essentially, this inequality, which is 
changing measure distance with entropy and measuring distance with variance, uh, it, it does have a spectral interpretation, which is just the spectral gap of F. Okay. So essentially, as I said, the, the spectrum of L is just uh, is like that, no? the zero and then all the negative ones, because I'm assuming quantum detail balance, the spectrum is real. So the, the spectral gap is this, is in the spectral gap between zero and the, and the first negative eigenvalue. Okay, good. Okay, so the, this is very relevant because of two reasons. First of all, it already gives a bound on the MLSI constant. Proposition alpha MLSI is bigger or equal than lambda gap. I mean, it's called me, it's called this lambda to um, times one over one plus the logarithm of the norm of the inverse of rho infinity of the norm of yes, yes, yes I said right the norm of rho infinity minus one and this is the operator norm okay if you want is take the um, inverse of the minimal eigenvalue of rho infinity take the logarithm and one over log is the price to pay well it's one price to pay to go from a bound on gap to a bound of MLSI okay so usually for thermal states something like that this object is exponential in the size of the system because I have a log I get something which is polynomial in the size of the system so already I get alpha which is polynomial in the size of the system will give me polynomial time convergence in relative entropy okay, which is not that bad okay so already having a convergence on the gap already gives me polynomial time convergence in relative entropy and in particular in trace law okay so it's an again i mean at least for cases like thermal states and other things otherwise of course this price might be too strong to pay good okay so so far uh, and okay uh, and I forgot to say this is weaker than that okay it's maybe not obvious but it is okay so so far we have LSI which is equal to hypercontractivity implies MLSI implies gap uh, okay and that that's how is how it is okay so so far I did just a single particle case meaning that they have just one Hilbert space and I do in that Hilbert space I'm not using at all that they have many particles and a structure between the particles and now this is this woo, the next woo, I'm, super bad in time so the, this is uh, but as always of course so that's not something I, I was not expecting so now the interesting thing is what happens now in the many particle case so this all this so far so far in the single particle case and now we like to go to the many many bar. Okay, good. So, yes. so many in a quantum. I guess that what you want is many qubits. Yes, or, or qubits or something. Yes, yes. But the qubit is just simple. Yes. So you are thinking about just one particle. No, no, but but no, but you, you can it can it can. Yeah, but then in that sing, case, no single particle is uh, d doesn't need to be two d. But the thing is that because you are not you are not putting into the problem yet the fact that usually interactions are local in the sense that 
the Limbladian or Tonian or whatever has a particular structure that reflects the fact that you have many particles and that particles can only interact with those which are close. So, for instance, a quantum computer, uh, like say the Google or IBM or something, there is a pattern of interaction. So, a particle can only interact with the next ones. And then, essentially, this tells you that the type of interactions are very of a very particular type. And the same with these particles in the Hamiltonian. And the thing is that now, if you consider Hamiltonians or Limbranians with this particular geometrically local interaction, uh, can you get bounds on alpha uh, that the scale nice on the number of particles on the system size? That, that's what you care. Because essentially what you care is how things, whatever, I mean, convergence of algorithms, convergence of noise, scales with the system size. That, that's the relevant one. And that, that's, this only makes sense in the many body regime where you have many particles. I don't know if this makes sense or. Well, the, what I was thinking is that if you are speaking in qubits, and yes. qubits is C2, mm -hmm. you are speaking about just one particle for this, it's just C2. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> no, but yes, yes, no, no. <laughs> what I mean, single particle is single Hilbert space, and there is no internal structure on L of H or anything. Because in general, for instance, yeah, yeah, okay, so that, that's a bit the, the point. And in the end, in order to, to show, I mean, it's a very non-trivial question, because essentially in order to show bounds for many particles, in the end, you could, the strategy is to go back to bound on a single particle. Okay. Okay. And then there, even this bound is not trivial, I would say, because we need a bound which is called a complete bound. We need something called complete modified ML, complete MLSI, uh, but okay, essentially they're bounds like that for single particles. Yeah. Well, then I have to say, what is actually particle? Oh, sorry. Particle has different, is, is, is jargon for different things in different quantum areas. So, many details, so for I instance, agree. frequently for me, particle means actually that I have a P squared over 2M plus a potential or something. Yes. Uh, and that's, I think, where he's coming from. And then particle is actually single system. And what you are looking is at if I uh, tensor it n times whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but as with that, essentially what, I, what I'm seeing is that if you are anywhere close to a phase transition, uh, for if you have a thermal state and you're looking at uh, phase transitions, you are going to be in deep trouble in trying to apply this kind of thing, or am I completely mistaken? It's a good question, and I don't know. Uh, so the thing is, L, I mean, yeah, it's a good question, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so it's a question that needs to be probably clarified in the following sense. So, so in general, so when we understand, when we try to analyze thermal noise in Hamiltonian, so one thing is the Hamiltonian itself, and the other is the generator of the noise. And depends, I mean, the, the, this generator can be totally independent of the Hamiltonian, like for instance, in, uh, single site noise uh, or can be, yeah, the Davis generator of essentially the, the weak coupling limit of the of the thermal bath with respect to the Hamiltonian and of course then L has information from the Hamiltonian or other things uh, but uh, this gap is the gap of L the principle is not the gap of the Hamiltonian or anything like that um, yes, on the other hand of course in one would expect that, for instance, one can prove uh, that if, and maybe this is the, this answers your question, but so one can prove that if L, if you have an alpha which is independent of the system size, and therefore you have exponential plus convergence, then <laughs> is this going to say? Uh, no, 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 no. Oh. Yeah, I would expect. So, what I would expect is that, but now, no, probably, uh, what I would expect is that essentially, 
if you have some fast mixing to the thermal state, this uh, okay, have to clarify my mind. Then the, the state, the fish point, um, cannot be the thermal state. Um, so ca cannot have power law decaying correlations. Essentially, it should have some sort of exponential decaying correlations, and therefore you cannot be in a, in a phase transition. Whether I whether I do have a proof of that or not, okay, I have to think. But okay, this is what I would expect. So that you cannot get uh, this fast mixing for thermal states at a phase transition where you have power law decaying correlations. Uh, but I have to think carefully if the results we know for fixed points of fast mixing in Bladians imply this this exponential clustering, which probably they do, but I have to rethink. Maybe I can tell you later. But yes, yes. So yeah, this. But that's because exactly the properties. Okay, and this comes now exactly to 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 this. So okay, so so maybe exactly. So particle means single site. So since where there is no many body behind. So let me define this many body, and maybe this clarifies many of the questions, and also many of the questions we we need. And then this many body regime is the regime that we care in quantum computing. First of all, because several of the models of quantum computation are just reduced to standard many body problems. Uh, um, if not, because, uh, yeah, okay, it's like a quantum computer is a many body quantum system. So, so what is the many body regime? So, we take a, a lattice. Lattice now in the sense of essentially let's say two dimensions and take C2. Uh, so essentially all points in the plane with integral coefficients. Okay? That's 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 a lattice. Um, again, this is inf infinite, so let's do finite. I'm, a, I'm a, an analyst. It's very weird to avoid infinite all the times, but that's that's how it is. So, uh, so I will take just a finite sublattice, lambda. lambda L or N, and just simply let's say C two intersection minus N N cross minus N F. No. So essentially, this is okay. So they have to see that n is large. Exactly, and then we are interested in the case n goes to infinity, and all we care is how things scale with n. This is all okay. Well, this things I care in this talk and generally care is how things scale with n. For people doing operator algebras, one can define the thermodynamic limit rigorously with operator algebras, a la Bratelli Robinson and these things. Uh, but again, many of the results uh, there can be proven by proving nice asymptotics. So that's, 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 that's I will stick to finite, but caring about the asymptotics. Good. Uh, okay, so, okay, so that's my lattice. Uh, and now, what I do is I put in each vertex of the lattice a Hilbert space. So I associate. So in each vertex of the lattice, I have a quantum system, a particle, what they call a particle. This is probably not the right name, but let's call it like that. It's a quantum system in each vertex of the lattice. So I, I associate a quantum system to each vertex of the matrix. Doesn't matter as long as this is constant, doesn't depend on n. So so H V for a vertex is C D, and the important thing is that this constant independent of n. This is all I care. Because I, all I care about asymptotics in n, 
I can fix d to 2, 3, 27, doesn't matter as long as it's not a function of f. And then the space of the system is, of course, the tensor product, as we know, because of the axioms of all this. Okay? It's a very good question. Uh, in general, a lot. <laughs> really a lot. So some things we can only know how to prove in 1D, some things we know how to prove in 2D, uh, very few things we know how to prove in 3D. Okay. That's how it is. Yeah. But I mean, the formalism can be done in any, of course. I mean, it's just about the result. Yeah, yeah well, yes, indeed, good. It's a very good thing that some things are purely 2D. So for some things, I, I do need 2D. But I agree that maybe it's, it's a very good idea, uh, indeed. Uh, some, I can do also. Uh, no, 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 but this is you know, very interesting. Let's do that. Let's sure, sure, sure. So I can also do exactly the. Uh, it's a, this is minus n, n. Yes, yes, I also do that. I don't, okay. Let's call this. This. I can also do this. Yes, yes. And then the systems are here. Yes, that is interesting indeed. And some some high non trivial results in one degree, one can prove this. Um, okay, good. So okay, so that's the, the Hilbert space. And now we okay, we have to define Hamiltonians. As we know, the Hamiltonians are the energy observables in the systems, are the things that uh, mathematically codify the interactions between the particles, and they define the time evolution of for closed systems, so they are very relevant. Uh, so H, we consider Hamiltonians, which have a local structure. So I can define as a sum of some P, tensor identity of some P, Let's say plaquette, for instance. Okay, uh, I, ca I can do this abstractly in full generality. I don't know if it's needed, but let me try first to understand the, the idea. So now, identity in the rest, so in the complementary of the plaquette. So take one plaquette, for instance, this. Okay, so the plaquette defines four vertices. It's this, 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 and this, no? So now HP, this HP is a, an, a acts on, is an operator, a self-adjoint operator that acts on the tensor product of the vertices that belongs to the plaquette of HB and nothing else. And then tensor identity in the rest. So this means, for instance, that these four particles interact together with an interaction. And then uh, these other four interact with a different interaction, or the same, doesn't matter, because I examine on all possible plaquettes. Okay. So this is a very particular structure of the Hamiltonian. Okay. It's what is called a local structure. Okay. So the interactions are only between nearest neighbor particles, in this case, between four body nearest neighbor particles. This is just a particular local Hamiltonian. One could do instead of plaquettes, segments, like nearest neighbor interactions, or sums of segments and plaquettes, or sums of other things. But the important thing is that all the terms here involve very few particles that are geometrically close together. OK? It's clear? So I can write this formally uh, if you want. Uh, yes, yes. Yes. I will do PVC for simplicity. There is no need, but I will do PVC for simplicity. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly, exactly. So, exactly. So the question is very relevant. It's about what happens at the boundary. Uh, and this is a very important and subtle question that I will just skip a bit. Uh, and I, by considering periodic boundary conditions. So I will consider this with periodic boundary conditions, and this means that I'm in a torus. 
Okay, I'm just identifying this with this, 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 this with this in a torus. Okay. This this is not the only option, uh, but this will simplify my presentation. <laughs> And in general, nice behaving Hamiltonians are properties are somehow in a sense insensitive to the boundary conditions in the bulk. I mean bulk properties. It's not boundary properties, bulk properties. Uh, okay, so as I said, I did this for plaquettes, but can do for any things. So in general, one can do abstractly and define, okay, we'll write very fast here that I, one can define for every. One can define for every x in the um, in the uh, in, in the lattice. I can define some interaction phi of x. This is the self-adjoint operator on tensor product of b in x h v with the property that phi of x is equal to zero. If the diameter of x is bigger than some constant r, okay. So to show that only particles interact if they are close enough, and then the Hamiltonian is the sum in all x of phi x tensor identity in the rest. Okay, so that's so that's the generalization of this, and this is called a local interaction or a local Hamiltonian. Knows that local doesn't imply that a single site, so there are interactions. Okay, so local means that the interactions are bounded around a region all the time. Okay. Uh, the same for the Limblavia. It's a local in Blavia. Okay. And now the question is how to bound the MLSA constant of L or ah okay, sorry, relational invariance. That's important also. Sorry, sorry. Yes, yes. In general, I will assume relational invariance. Relation invariance, relation invariance, meaning that these HP are all the same for all plaquettes. HP equal HP prime uh, or LP equal LP prime. Okay. Okay, it's interaction. Okay, the, the location of the interaction is different, but the interaction itself is the same. Okay, so this is just the same interaction translated there. Good. Because it's the nicest way in which one can talk about uh, scalings. Because now to define the object, uh, we, we just need to define this object or this object, and then I suddenly have H or L for all N. Okay, so now, um, Okay. Oh, okay, how to, how to take some decisions. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, let me see. Okay, first of all, any questions about this? And then, so now the question is how the MLSA constant. Yes. No, it's a very good question, too. Oh. 
Ah, no, no, yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. No, no, no. Yeah, it's a good, yeah, it's a very good question. So, doesn't need to be this nice lattice, but in order to talk about translation invariant systems, you need a nice way to translate. But it doesn't need to be the square lattice. It can be honeycomb lattice, triangular lattice, any other thing. So, but you need some regularity in the lattice. And in many of the results... But then, but then why translation invariant? Why the geometry doesn't... I mean, in, in general, the ways that particle interact, no, no, I mean, again, this is just to understand a bit the presentation, but the traditional invariance is really not a problem uh, at all. You know, that, that in, in, nothing I'm going to do has anything to do, any problem with that. Uh, so you can forget about this. It. Simply, it's a nice way in which there is a, a way to define this scaling in a nice way without thinking, uh, because, because there's a natural way to define H for all N trivially. Uh, but, but yeah, for many problems of interest, uh, in general, uh, okay, many problems of interest, you do have traditional invariance, but in others you don't. Uh, so, but th there is nothing really important there. But this is not a problem, really. Um, but for instance, in order to talk about, so, I mean, it depends on the, on the if questions come from condensed matter physics, then traditional invariance is very natural. Um, no, because I'm, no, no, wait. What is, what is the, uh, yes, yes. Quantum magnetism, I think, is okay. Yeah, yeah, but quantum magnetism probably is the, is the, the, uh, yeah, when, when you have, yeah, spins interacting with each other, uh, and, yeah, things like, like, generating strange phases of matter, like topological spin liquids and things like that. These, these things are not well understood. This Sorry? <laughs> the space distance means distance between things? Or what is the space? Yeah, 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 yes, 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 yes. This is this physical distance, yes. <laughs> physical distance, yes. This is physical distance, yes, yes, yes. Yes, I, okay, probably again, yeah, yeah. As far as I know, uh, yeah, exactly. Many problems in quantum magnetism really are still open, I would say, and they, they, the way to address those is by numerics, by doing numerical, classical numerics for quantum systems is extremely expensive and in general it's not clear that you have nice convergence. Indeed, one of the main aspect applications of quantum mechanics, sorry, of quantum computation is to do better simulations of condensed matter quantum systems. And in particular, these are systems that we like to simulate in a quantum computer. So this is one thing. On the other, a quantum computer itself has these properties. So you have the qubits in particular locations in the chip, and they can interact with each other only with those which are close by, and they are 2D. So it's exactly this. Uh, but also, problems that are known to be universal for quantum computation uh, are also uh, or, or say, alternative models of quantum computation that can be reduced to obtain ground states of a Hamiltonian, or fixed points of a Limbladian. Uh, these Hamiltonians and these Limbladians also have this structure. Essentially, all, <coughs> yeah. Okay, for quantum computing purposes, this setup is pretty general, I would say, complete. Okay, there are many systems like Coulomb interactions which are not covered, but uh, okay. Yeah. It could be yeah, sure, sure, sure. Of course, no, there are classical, classical spin systems. Are particular cases of that. Yes, yes. It is, of course, in classical statistical mechanics, you have icing models, and, and these, of course, model many things, even probably for, I don't know, uh, interactions of people and these things. I agree. Yes, 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 definitely. Some 
processes between people as, well, as long as uh, there's a notion of distance and the process is local. Uh, yes. Okay, so what I was saying, MLC constant. Ah, exactly. So we'd like to understand how the MLC constant or spectral gap of L scales yeah, scales as n goes to infinity. Um, okay, so the as I said, we are considering Limbladians, which are quantum detail balance. Uh, so this means that understanding this is a particular case of understanding this. This is not obvious. And the reason is that in order to make the Limbladian self-adjoint, one needs to change the Hilbert space uh, and co consider this weighted L2 space in which the weights come from the fixed point of the Limbladian. But there is a very nice recent paper by Tai Arad and collaborators. Okay, I have the reference there if you are Arad at all. In which they show that under minimal conditions on the Limbladian, the locality is preserved. So essentially, if you would like to understand local Limbladians, which quantum detail balance is enough to understand local Hamiltonians. Which is nice. So now, as I said, in order to prove an MLSI constant, the strategy is to bound the spectral gap and then upgrade. Okay, this also has been done in the classical case in several, in several conditions. And that's so far the only tools we know is how to, to bound the MLSI constant. So putting these things together, essentially, the key question is how to bound gaps of local Hamiltonians. Okay, so essentially this boils down to the main question is how to estimate. And of course, then I will show how to upgrade or which are the ways we know how to upgrade. But the main question is how to estimate gaps, spectral gaps. of uh, local Hamiltonians. Okay. Or in general, okay, understand the spectral gap of a local Hamiltonian. Okay, we, so let me define the spectral gap. Um, and then, yeah, maybe you have to finish yes yes no no yeah yeah no yeah 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 sorry sorry yeah yeah sorry so, sorry let me let me repeat again so again this l is not h so let, let's so let's, let's take for instance take H the Hamiltonian of the toric code as a quantum memory, and I would like to understand how thermal noise acts there. So this defines me a Limbladian, which is the thermal noise Limbladian. This thermal noise is quantum detail balance. So there is another Hamiltonian, another Hamiltonian for which I, I would like to understand the spectral gap, which is. Not the Tory code Hamiltonian. Tory code I know is gapped, but that's not what they care about. Uh, and this is this new Hamiltonian that I define via the Limbladian because it's quantum detail balance, is the one I would like to understand. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the. So this is why you need to understand the spectrograph of local Hamiltonians like as a general problem. Yes, 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 yes. So the. the so, okay, so, yeah, yes, 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 pro probably I, I can comment on that. So, uh, let me define the, the local Hamiltonian, so the spectral gap first, uh, and then I, I will make comments on that, and maybe with that I finish. So, for today, and maybe I have to rethink how to do tomorrow. Uh, 
because this was more or less the end of my first lecture, expected end of my first lecture. So, so probably. So, okay. So, okay. So, uh, so how do you find the spectral gap? So, so I have H n is the sum of all plaquettes that lives in the lambda n of HP tensor identity in the rest. Okay. Uh, this is an operator on the it's called Hilbert space of lambda n that as I say vertices in uh, uh, lambda n HV is an operator there. Uh, and this is a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So this is a Hermitian operator there. I can diagonalize it. Okay. So I, I take the eigenvalues. So HN is lambda 0, V0, V0 plus. Um, okay, let's rewrite it like some, some pi zero to whatever big D, some exponentially large dimension, lambda i, vi, vi. Of course, this is the dimension of the hv to the power of the size of n. It's exponentially large, and these are ordered. Let's assume, indeed. Uh, okay, let's assume the ground state is non-degenerate, or should I? Yeah, it doesn't matter, really. Okay, yeah, let's assume it's non-degenerate, though in later it will be degenerate, but it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, or, or let me call it here projectors. Okay, these are PI. These are self adjoint projectors. And then... Now, this is true. And of course, all this depends on n. So now the spectral gap in n is simply lambda 1 minus lambda 0. And now h has a spectral gap. Or, okay, well, I'm interested in the limit in n of gamma n, okay. how this behaves. Okay, for instance, if this, so this is what they care about. Okay, so this is the spectral gap, finite gap, and this limit is the spectral gap. Okay, so that's what we care about. And now, coming back to Enrique's question, yes, uh, the spectral gap is a very hard problem. So, for instance, knowing whether this limit is zero or not is undecidable, even in 1D. Uh, so it's as hard as it can be. So it's a hard question in general. Even for, for two, I mean, for, for, for in 1D, for nearest neighbor interactions, is undecidable. This is a, a theorem we proved two or three years ago. Uh, so it's very hard. But, of course, this is worst case always. When something is undecidable, it's the worst case. Uh, so even if the problem is undecidable, we like to show that, okay, maybe for some families of Hamiltonians, um, we can give bounds on that. And this is the goal. So it's impossible. We cannot expect to prove or to give results that work for every possible Hamiltonian, even in 1D. No way. Okay? But, but okay, we can... This simply shows that the problem is very hard. Uh, but, but okay, we, we can try to do this for families of, 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 uh, of Hamiltonians. And then tomorrow I will try to, to, to go into that. So uh, the plan for tomorrow probably was, is, is going to be the what a bit of time to talk about the spectral gaps of local Hamiltonians and how these things are related to tensor networks. That's very important. Uh, then go briefly through these models of quantum computation, uh, maybe more briefly than I thought. 
um, and, sh and tell you how these spectral gaps and the MLSA constants enter there to see how these things are important to estimate. And then finish with this particular example in which we can, can compute this, which is a, a, yeah, thermal noise of uh, what are called self-correcting quantum memories, which is difficult to, to show an application of how these methods enter into a concrete problem. Uh, but okay, this, this is going to be tomorrow, so that's it for today. Thank you. Eh, pues claro, a lo mejor no, precisamente porque voy muy mal de tiempo. <risa> <risa>